ThreatLocker implements a least privileged approach to cybersecurity, blocking every executable unless specifically authorized by your team. This methodology mitigates ransomware, supply chain attacks, and zero-day exploits, and ensures 24-7, 365 protection for your organization. To learn more about how ThreatLocker can help prevent known and unknown threats in your digital environment, safeguard your data and operations from threat actors, and align your organization with respected compliance frameworks, visit securityweekly.com forward slash threat locker. If your organization is ready to enhance cyber resilience, we have important insights for you. The Level Blue Futures Report 2024 sheds light on how rapid computing changes affect IT visibility. Our research reveals that while IT leaders see positive outcomes, 85% acknowledge increased risk. In this report, we identify the barriers to cyber resilience, the challenges impacting cybersecurity, and the business context that reveal operational issues. You'll also discover what's on the horizon and five essential steps for prioritizing cyber resilience. Get your complimentary copy of this crucial research today by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash level blue. Cybersecurity, simplified. Do your end users always, and I mean always without exception, work on company owned devices and IT approved apps? I didn't think so. So my next question is, how do you keep your company's data safe when it's sitting on all those unmanaged apps and devices? 1Password has an answer to this question, Extended Access Management. 1Password Extended Access Management helps you secure every sign-in for every app on every device because it solves the problems traditional IAM and MDM can't touch. Check it out at securityweekly.com forward slash 1Password. That's the number one password. Welcome back to Business Security Weekly. I am your host, Matt Alderman, joined by Jason Albuquerque and Ben Carr. Stay up to date with us on X, formerly known as Twitter, for the latest show clips and updates. Find us at SEC Weekly and stay connected with our cybersecurity community. All right, now, gentlemen, we have not done articles in a while. We've been like double interviews and then say easy, do hard. A lot has transpired in the last month. Uh, so... <laughs> I had plenty to choose from. A little busy. Yeah, a little busy. And some really interesting news that I wanted to pull forward. So in, in addition to the typical leadership communication, there's also been some really interesting news around solar winds and the SEC uh, and obviously some of the, the, the stuff with CrowdStrike. So um, let's start with the first one. Um, cybersecurity leadership crisis dooming America's companies. You don't say. Who would have thought? And I, I mean, it, it, you know, it revolves around everything we've been talking about, making sure you have leadership at the board level, right? I mean, that's a, that's a big portion of this article here. And, it, and it's funny, you know, it, it calls out the CrowdStrike incident and it says, while the CrowdStrike incident is shocking and eye-opening to many businesses and boardroom leaders, it actually shouldn't be, right? Because and they were keeping their eye on the ball and they knew that there were risks. It, that was the perfect you know, example of the system. preparing for that risk, type of risk. Right? Like so, that critically affected the entire system because of one small absolutely defect. um yeah i was surprised by this article i've never i've never talked about this yeah. this has never been a concern of mine we've never talked about it on the show i mean it's just i, I yeah i mean it's a, this is this is eye-opening so um <laughs> <laughs> holy sarcasm Look, and, and acd <laughs> is starting to talk about this right um you know, there's you know, other groups that are out there that are talking about this i went and got qte certified this year but yeah like why don't we have someone on the board yep. who is a risk expert we just don't like it's Right. You want to know? You want to know what I love about this article, though? Hugh Thompson from RSA came out and said, yeah. "You want to know what? CEOs should be more demanding." He started putting some weight on the CEOs. CEOs mm -hmm. should be more demanding about adding cybersecurity expertise to the boardroom. Bravo! Yeah, I love that move. You want to know what? If the boards aren't going to do it themselves, guess what? CEOs step up and start having a conversation. Yeah. The the yeah, quote in here, uh, <laughs> I love. In the words of Warren Buffett, "Risk comes from not knowing what you are doing." Yep. Many boards don't know what they are doing on cybersecurity because they have no expertise on the board. That's why it's a risk. So why don't you solve for that risk? Put somebody on your board that understands yeah, and this it, stuff you know, look, so you can it's, actually it's have a not, conversation I've, I've heard this concept it. of like, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to replace people on the board. Uh, expand the board, like grow the board larger, like 
like I, I don't understand what the hesitancy is. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, and I haven't heard effective arguments against it. I've just heard we do, we don't need you know cyber expertise on the board. It's not helpful, and I I think it's clearly been shown by massive incidents like Change Healthcare, yeah. CDK Global, um, you know the CrowdStrike issue. Like risk is a huge freaking problem, and when you when you Itemize it as your number. Usually, cyber is the number one risk on a corporate board. It's certainly in the top three, but it's usually number one for most. Why don't you have somebody who's targeted to top effectively three. address it and mm-hmm. bring insight to the board and help? I mean, geez. And this article, it, it walks through like lack of director cybersecurity expertise mm-hmm. leads to superficial check the box oversight. Yep. yep. Compliance mentality, anybody? Boards without cybersecurity experts rely too heavily on the CISO. If they have a CISO. If, if they yeah, have, and right. sometimes yeah, like, I think the, like the, the Warner Report called this out, right? Like in Change Healthcare, they hired somebody who really didn't have the requisite right. experience to do this. And so where was the CEO and board oversight? I, I think companies are putting themselves in front of an extreme amount of liability and the potential for litigation from shareholders, I... I would be really scared if I wasn't looking in this direction right now. Like it, it could be considered malfeasance. Yes. So Jason, that ties into article number two, the role of the CEO right. in cyber defense leadership and responsibility. Should they stand up and say, look, we need cybersecurity expertise at the board level. 100%. It's one of the first ones that's laid out in this article. C- CEOs are there to evangelize for the company. They're there as that top executive running that company. And they need to be comfortable enough sitting in front of that board saying, no matter what, we need to make a decision on bringing cybersecurity expertise to this board, and we have to figure out a way to make that happen. If you don't want anybody on this board being replaced, expand the board, like Ben said, right? That's a stroke of a pen decision that you can make with the board. Stroke of a pen. Add one additional resource because of lack of experience in the cybersecurity realm, right? And just expand the board. Yeah, and the co- I mean, what's the cost? I mean, it's really not that high, Compared? right? Like, well, what's the downside? You have more expertise and experience right. and uh, additional right. voice. Like, right. hey, it doesn't make sense. And, and at least you can get be informed about what's going on and understand <clears throat> what the potential risks are. Right now, they're like ostriches with their heads in the sand. Exactly. Yeah, that's and not I think, helping you know, anybody. The, the CEO actually has a unique role. Obviously, he's a CEO, but from a cyber perspective, you know, managing up to the board and making sure the board has the right contextual membership, right? But also managing down and making mm-hmm. sure that he's articulating the right uh, mood to the rest of the company, right? The right culture. Because if that doesn't happen, then the CE, the CISO is mm-hmm. effectively handicapped and can be ineffectual because everybody else says, "Hey, you've got no, yeah. you've got no power," so I'm just going to bypass you and everything. And so. CEO is super important, and I don't think engaged enough. No, I mean, I this, art, this article goes through a lot of good strategic mm-hmm. uh, items for the CEO, right? Cybersecurity is a strategic imperative, cultivating a security culture like you talked about, making sure that you have governance and risk management as a focal point, uh, investment, not only in technology, but in talent. Hello. And, and you know, one of the little caveats I, wanna, I wanted to put in there for that piece of it is doesn't necessarily always mean on staff talent. You can have really good business partners too, right? I mean, that's it's a combination yeah. of talent that you want to bring in and make sure you're getting folks trained and, and up to speed. They talk about incident response and recovery. A couple of places that you know they, they didn't really talk about was the legal side, right? I mean, that, I think that needs yeah. to be an aspect of that where there is legal. And then I'll put in there as maybe a separate or maybe under legal, but compliance. Because if you're regulated or you're in a certain industry, you need to make sure that you have the, the compliance side of the aisle too, so. Or just my couple of little yeah. add-ins. And, and it, it, it does lay out really good areas that CEOs should yeah. focus on. Now, how you do some of these, we can debate, you know, well, how much, how much of this versus how much of that and what do you use, et cetera. But just having the CEO, this is almost a CEO checklist. It, it 100% is. And you yeah. need to be playing in every single one of these spaces, at least a little bit, to be able right. to make progress. You know what? Start a journey in every single one of these areas and you'll be on your way. And then it's about just continuously improving over time. You know, I, I yeah. understand that it may be daunting or it may be something that, you know, you don't necessarily have an expertise. But what are you going to do? Do nothing? Do nothing isn't an option. And that's what most organizations are doing. Nothing. 
Well, think of all the companies that decide to do nothing. Then the CrowdStrike incident mm-hmm. happened. They're not prepared to respond. Right. Yeah. Because that happened. Right. To a number of companies. Right. How many days were, were I mean, Delta took probably the brunt yeah, of some of yeah. this. I mean, we're going to, we're going to talk and, about and this. Delta has a really good CISO. Like, I know yes, that some of the yes. stuff is in place at Delta. Right. And, right? and the question becomes how how influential is the CISO in the business continuity plan? I don't know. I can't tell you that, right? Because that was all right, business right. continuity at the end of the day is, is getting those machines back up and running. So right. I, I don't know how influential the CISO is in BCDR. And it needs to be after. Yeah, I mean, in the next article, we're going to talk about ago. CrowdStrike, but 10 days later, there's still 1% of the world still, you know, down. I mean, still recovering. So, yeah. I, and that was 10 days of an outage. Yeah. So, good good segue when CrowdStrike strikes. What do you do? <laughs> right. <laughs> now, this, uh, this article is really geared towards quality assurance and quality quality control. You can tell that the author of this is really pushing the QA, QC side. What I found really, really interesting is to do really good QA and QC means sometimes you got to slow stuff down, right? And in the, we've been in this mindset of innovate at all costs. Where did that get us in this case? Right. It failed got fast. a pretty big outage. Well, yeah. this failed yeah. pretty fast. <laughs> failed fast. Yeah. And it <laughs> failed pretty hard. Yeah. 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 Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so if you're not doing that, yeah. You know, I, it's, there's, this is such a complex issue, right? Because there's so much involved with what happened. And I don't know if anybody had the opportunity to read the, they, 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 they actually published an external technical root cause analysis about this whole thing. Right. And it's, and it's channel channel file 291 is the actual file name of that that channel file that came out yeah yeah they pushed one more file than they were supposed to push it, right and at the end of the, the day memory. when you when you start looking through the root cause you really start to hold your you know really face palm because this was an epic failure in in QA and best practice and i mean at the at the end of it they didn't even have a parser for these these channel files, the updates, they used regex. They used regex to QA this. I mean, I, it it just blows my mind to see that. You know, regex and kernel code. Think about this. This is kernel code, right? This is yes. kernel code for early launch anti malware. So it's yeah. it's pre boot that this stuff is running, right? Uh-huh. So it's pre operating system regex and kernel code should not be allowed should not be allowed i have so many so this is the danger of kernels understood right? there, but there's a purpose right because you can get so yes good. I, I, there's a purpose no right? i understand there is right there definitely is but the the my my opinion here is the the extent of this attack is because it's sitting at the kernel layer before os boot up which is mm-hmm. why microsoft blue screens a death yeah. right yeah. Anything you're doing at the kernel should be so well checked and QA'd it, and protected absolutely. because of that. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, and, and this seems like one of those things, like, how did you not catch this? How, how, like, like how, I don't understand that. Like, the, I don't the, understand. The like, channel. is it an admission that you didn't go through a QA cycle? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the channel file itself was from an older format. It wasn't even from, even from the more modern format. And the check was expecting 21 fields and only received 20. It should have failed right there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's and, and the other thing, mind. like, you know, if you take in this to consideration with, uh, with solar winds, right? Like this is a, this is a map that like any one of these vendors that's doing anything at the kernel level yeah. better make sure their security is oh tight God. because I, I'm gonna tell you actors right are going to come after this and see, this is like, this is the window, but right? The this is a is map Microsoft to how to do gonna this. going to start clamping down and not allowing it. And the only thing, in all honesty, the only thing I think that could ever stop them is the fact that they've been be monopolizing EDR at the end of the day, right? You'd mm-hmm. start to have antitrust if they start not allowing third parties into the kernel because yeah, only, but the, there are things that can get there are things the you kernel, can only right? protect that they're trying to protect against, yeah. right? By running at this level, right? So, like, there's a there's a validity to it, but a 
but uh, this is the Mac versus yeah. PC thing, right? Like Apple doesn't allow this level of access, right? Right, 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 right. So, but here's right. the other thing that blows yeah. my mind too. So many SaaS organizations now, when they when they push updates, they do what they call the staggered rollout. Either it's regional or you know yeah. they do staggered rollouts. Mm-hmm. How much? I mean, it would still suck. But how much if there was only one region of the world that was affected to this or one region of the U.S. that was affected by this and then they shut it down? Something like well, that again, like that to minimize the blast radius, at least. Yeah. And, and that was that was my point in the earlier uh, segment. Right. Like, uh, again, like you're, you're saying staggered rollout for the vendor. Right. Yeah. I'm saying then inside the organization, sure. some type of staggered rollout in the org. Like if you had looked at a a full chain of best practice in deployment and rollout. There could have been some mitigation on this, right? But everybody's trying to go as fast and furious as possible. And I think to a point, like, we just trust some vendors without questioning sometimes. And I think there needs to be more of the questioning versus just trust at all costs. Yeah. Just because you're a very large vendor doesn't mean you get inherent trust. No, agreed. Right? Agreed. You know, and it's, 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 that, it's that balance, too, because you sit back and you say, we always want to make sure that we're following vendor best practices. And vendor best practices is make sure you have auto updates because we have these critical channel files that we need to be pushing out there and these critical updates that we have. We need to stop zero days, right? And so it's, 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 it's this balance of sitting there saying, all right, if we take this platform and we QA every, QA every single portion of this, every release, I mean, those channel files, I want to say are daily releases, Ben. Like they're, 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 Think about this. This is yeah. this is CI CD pipeline on steroids. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So you're gonna vet. No, every single I, one I, of these I get it. I get it. But days. is that is that what we should be doing? Like again, put yourself on the risk professional side, right? Yeah, okay, maybe maybe unforeseeable before this happened, right? That it could cause this large of a of an outage. But after the fact, like, don't you have to question it and say, yeah, I mean, I, I get it. There's some amount of risk I'm gonna have. Yep to some zero day actor, but what's the potential incident rate for that happening per year to me, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, if I'm, if I'm behind a couple days, is, is the, like, like you said, it's a balance, right? It's figuring out what the risk quotient is and how it's applied correctly for your so, org. So, so here you go, so, Ben, ready? I just looked it up. I, will, I looked it up on their technical, their technical site on CrowdStrike. Updates to channel files are a normal part of the sensor's operation and occur several times per day. Yeah, that's uh, how do yeah. you manage that, Ben? You can't. Right. Can't. You can't. So 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 then I then I guess I would question, is that the best is that the best uh, vendor? That's, that's is that the, the other, way I should be doing this? Right? Side. Like, yeah. That's, and maybe so that's why the, maybe that's why we have folks going, hmm, can I can I talk about other EDRs and learn more about those right now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And as a leader, but but you get to a certain point, like you've got the, you're the 800 pound gorilla and people just go, Oh, that must be great. I'm just going to go along with it. Right. People stop asking if they were a startup vendor and they had 10 customers, uh, people might've asked a little more in depth questions. Right. Yeah. So as a leader, think about all the other potential areas other than your endpoint Mm -hmm. EDR that potentially has kernel level access. Cause I know a few and they're in the AppSec space and on the container side. Think about some of these highly privileged kernel based solutions that are also potentially susceptible to something similar that could take down your critical application. As a leader, I'd be reanalyzing, looking at all my solutions going, where else could this happen? Oh yeah. 100%. Absolutely. And then, and then figuring and, and if out you're the a vendor right now, you better be thinking hard about how to answer some of these objections because they're going to come over the next oh, six months. Well, 100%. Right. And, and, and at the end of it, now you start have to, you have to start having that conversation like Ben talked about. Do we continue with auto updating or do we do this in, in, in a sandbox first? And can my staff absorb that level of a burden to do that? With CrowdStrike, yeah. do you have the staff to be able to test out multiple channel file updates a day? No, you probably don't. So you have to think of something else. But these other yep. vendors, you know, if they're if they're pushing updates weekly, monthly, whatever the case may be, you don't know. Maybe it's worth it. Yeah. All right, here we go. This is a big <laughs> ruling. Yeah. Judge rejects SEC's aggressive approach to cybersecurity. Aggressive approach. 
The decision is a significant blow to the SEC's aggressive approach to cybersecurity enforcement. Not only did the court find the SEC failed to allege intentional fraud based on the disclosure in the company's SEC filings, but the court also found the SEC cannot use its internal accounting controls provision to regulate cybersecurity controls, a la Sarbanes-Oxley doesn't apply, right, y'all. Right. And, and, and yeah. we, we've had conversations on this show about it didn't go far enough. Right. <laughs> this is why. Oh, yeah. the dichotomy. Well, <laughs> if the SEC would just listen to the show, we could have told them they didn't go far <laughs> Not enough. Not far enough. <laughs> but I, I think even more challenging, right? Like this is going to be really hard uh, in light of Supreme Court decisions lately, right? That if there's yes. not law, that it's going to make it really hard for an agency yep. to try to come out and say, yeah. oh, we're going to make a determination, this... right? The, the overturning of Chevron sets a new order on these things. It's going to be really yep. difficult. This is and I, I think, you know, cyber, that... how are you going to stay current on it from a legal perspective? It's unwinding yeah. all the things that we thought were actually motions forward. Progress. Right. Yeah. It's unwinding it all. It, this, this, um, this this judgment aligned with the Supreme Court judgment makes it much more in the it, it's it's up to Congress to do this. Sarbanes Oxley was passed as a law, yeah. right? To get this level of scrutiny for cybersecurity means Congress is going to have to come together and create the the cybersecurity version of Sarbanes Oxley if they want any chance in being able to enforce this. Across the yeah. board. And, that's and, what that's what I take out of these. And, two and you judges. want to know what, Matt? The unfortunate part is that our trusty bulldog in Congress for cybersecurity, Congressman Langevin, retired. Yep. He's no longer there. Yes, he's no longer there. He's been our bulldog for decades. Yep. And I don't see anybody right now in Congress that picks up this mantle. No, me either. Me either. That's the scary and part. Carries it forward. Yep. I know. Yeah. It's a, I to me these are. Some of this is a little bit of a setback to cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And and I think the only way it gets fixed, unfortunately, is Congress, which is just completely dysfunctional. Right. 100%. Oh. Huh. So is it time to pivot your strategy? <laughs> well, I would say Maybe. yes. Maybe. <laughs> Are you the SEC? Definitely. <laughs> Poor execution. Anyone? Anyone? Right. <laughs> All day long. <laughs> I, I I love this article yeah. um, for for a couple different reasons, right? Having run strategy, these are things you're thinking about, right? Is you know as you as you run a, a strategy, you're you're in the back of your mind, you're asking some of these questions that are in this article, and my previous company is is like the epitome of of this article, right? <laughs> and I'm sitting here reading it going, oh my gosh, so true. It's so true. Yeah. yeah. And it's, 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 you know, Ben alluded to it earlier. It's, it's how do you make sure you're, you're failing fast, but also balancing, don't allow yourself to cut ties too soon. Right. Because it, it really is yeah. that balancing act to say, you know, I really don't want to be wasting my team's cycles on something that's not going to work, but if I gave them another week or two, maybe they can get it. Or if I give them another month or another quarter or whatever the case may be, they could get it done, right? And 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 I love the article because it makes you ask the really hard questions. The say easy, do hard, right? Ask the really hard questions about why you're thinking about maybe cutting a project or cutting a strategy or or taking something off the block that was a strategic initiative for the year, you know, and in and, and poor execution, right? Are, are you changing? Are you looking to make the change just because the team who's execu executing is not doing a good job. And could you put a team in there that could actually execute and get it done for you? The other well, one that, is that that's that root cause analysis, right? Yeah. So you've got to have the, I guess the insight to look at an issue and say, look, do I understand where it actually is in process? And is it, is it the right thing moving forward? And sometimes that's critical analysis. It's also not getting too invested in your own baby, right? Like yep. this whole, like, don't call my baby ugly thing. Right. Like you can't, you got to get in a point where you can call your own baby ugly, right? right. And say, okay, I have right. questions about this. And then bring in other people, bring in advisors, right? Who have some expertise on this to give you external perspective because sometimes you're just too close to it, right? And so you got to yep. remove that bias. That, it, it's not that your baby's ugly. 
potentially. It's that my baby's pretty today, but as it grows up, it might get ugly. Sure. And you got to be ahead of that a little bit, Ben, right? Like when you think through some of these startup companies, right, that we're very familiar with, they have a really good starting idea that starts to grow the company. But at some point, if you're not thinking about the broader strategy, this thing can go sideways really, really fast, right? And I think what this article is trying to do is, you know, maybe try to take on something and, and you can't execute against it. You should abandon it. Uh, but there's always going to be external pressures in strategy. The market's yeah. constantly shifting around. Yeah, us, the market dynamics right? change, right? All the time. Yeah. Yes. It's not static. Right. Right. 100%. And then we want to go, oh, we got to be an AI company when you have no idea what AI the, is. The, shi the shiny yeah. new thing, right? The hey, look, a squirrel. Yeah. That can get you in trouble too. So that new opportunity that flies in front of you that makes you shift focus, that could be your demise because it's the hey, look, a squirrel moment and uh, you're, not, you're not taking your company in the right direction. Yeah. When you waste a man year's worth of engineering talent on yeah. an AI-driven hey. chatbot that failed. So like, can you hey, say, can you know, say that, well, hey, there's Facebook a, meta? Uh, FedRamp, right? Yeah, I mean, like, it's a metaverse. It's saying, oh, I need to do FedRamp. <laughs> I have no federal customers and there's no interest, but FedRamp, like I can go get money. Like that's not, yeah. Like have a purpose, have a reason, critically evaluate it. You got to do the work. Yes, you do. Um, adaptive leadership theory principles and frameworks for the future. Uh, another good article, by the Very way, good. like we've talked about adaptive leadership on, on the show multiple times. Um, look, I, this, this kind of paragraph kind of some summarizes for me in traditional leadership theory models, decision-making, uh, power is centralized with authority and hierarchy guiding the process. Leaders might consult with others, but ultimately the control rests with few individuals. Adaptive leadership, on the other hand, democratizes the process by actively involving everyone in an organization. This approach taps into the collective intelligence and diverse perspective of all team members, fostering a culture where ideas and beliefs are continuously evolving to meet new challenges and opportunities. That's where I want to work. Absolutely. Eliminate groupthink, right? Because when you have that centralized mindset and it's command and control from the top, you know, and you're not getting feedback from the rest of the organization, that's groupthink. Key is diversity, right? And, and I love how they go through really those, those, those four portions there of emotional intelligence organizational justice, making sure you have development, that learning experimentation and all of that, and then making sure you're building a culture that has character. You want that integrity. You want people to be living by the values. So I, I love those four aspects that they, that they cover. And our last article uh, for this week, leadership ideas for employee growth and development. We talked about culture, employee development, the skill sets, like these are all tied together, right? Not only from a leadership perspective, but from the challenges we're seeing with cybersecurity all the way up to the board level. Yep. Like, how do we, how do we continue to to nurture and grow yep. people and keep them? Because this that's a this is this is not easy stuff, Jason and no, Ben. Right. And and how we got we've got to do a better job of of nurturing and building our employees. Yeah, and 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 you know. You know me, I put things in order, right? But get personal is actually the first one. It should be the first one. Mm -hmm. You, in, in order to have an employee base that's going to be committed. Don't get too personal, Jason. No, understood. But but know, <laughs> know your, it's know your audience, right? It's it's know your employees. Yeah. It's know what motivates them, what what makes them tick, what gets them excited, what wants to, you know, the things they want to be doing with their career trajectory that, that you can help enable, right? It's not just what's in it for the company. It's what's in it for the employees. That's how you're going to get that dedication. That's how you're going to get that. And then from there, I think that goes right next to it is those, those um, mentorship opportunities, right? right? You need to be able to provide mentorship opportunities from your entry level intern all the way up to your executive team. You have to, you know, I've talked about it before having that personal board of directors. Well, why don't you take your executive team and help them build their own personal board of directors where they can have that, that group that they can go to when they, when they have questions. Then from there, you got to be, got to be training our managers. I think that's part of, you know, the mentorship opportunity is, is getting them training and getting them, you know, engaged in, in being leaders and, and actively thinking about being a leader to their staff. And then a great one is encourage lateral growth. That's, that's not something that a lot of managers do. Everybody's always thinking about promotion, but I, right. I'm a, I've done this in my career. It's long ball. If I make a lateral move now, the ladder is much higher on that other side. 
and I can continue to grow by making a lateral move and just, you know, being in another position of that same level within the organization, maybe the same salary range for a time period, but that's going to allow me to hockey stick. You know what? As a, as a manager, as a leader, encourage people to do that, especially if it's in an area of interest and help talk the employees through Here's the long-term benefit of you, number one, moving into this domain that you're interested in. And secondly, the career trajectory there is a lot higher than, than in the other place you were in. Mentorship. Yeah. And, yeah, and, super important. And, and I like your order because if you don't have those other things in place, promoting lateral movement might put you in a bind. 100%. <laughs> 100%. Right? Absolutely. So as you were laying it out, I'm like, you're going to put that one last because yeah. if you don't have your managers train, that lateral, that lateral move could impact your environment. Absolutely. But if you have all those other pieces in place, then you can encourage your employees to go yep. make that yep. lateral move. And, it's better right. for you. And I'm in a position to absorb your loss. Yeah. And, and the reason why I put mentorship opportunities above train, man, train, train managers is because the mentorship is a training. That's part yeah. of the training, right? Yeah. So that's why I put that first. That's that that should be table stakes training is mentorship. Made it from the top. Gentlemen, as always, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you everyone for watching and listening. We'll see you next week on Business Security Weekly.